Well, when we are here today to talk about the 95th Oscars, it's just around the corner. Uh, this year's Oscar ceremony comes on the heels of two record low ceremonies in 2021 and 2022, and lots of hand wringing and angst in the media and the commentary over why the Oscars ceremonies are, are not as well watched and popular as they were before. And in just, just like in previous years, the nominations for this year's Oscars has generated a lot of controversy as well as some, some real surprises as well. Yeah, and just just to note, there's going to be some spoilers ahead. Um, we're gonna we're gonna try to uh, resist spoiling too much, but it's going to come out. And also, I want to note that we're going to be focusing mostly on the best picture nominations as well as some of the other categories that piqued our interest. But we're not going to do a comprehensive overview of the nominations. Yeah, exactly. And we'll also discuss some films that we thought were maybe unfairly snubbed by the Oscars as well as offering up some films that we really enjoyed from, from 2022. I always try to make like a top 10 list for yeah, each year. Yeah, I'm looking year. forward to this. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it's often very, very different from what the Oscars chooses to kind of recognize. I know like the film critic, for example, Mark Kermode, always has, what does he call them, like the Kermode Awards? Or I think he has a more clever name than that, but... For example, in the year that uh, There Will Be Blood was nominated, he was just like horrified, as I think a lot of people were, that Johnny Greenwood's score was disqualified uh, on a on a quali- you know kind of a technical technicality, or uh, it, it wasn't able to be nominated uh, for right. best original score. And so I feel like that's where podcasts like this are are kind of important, right? To kind mm-hmm. of recognize and acknowledge uh, a lot of the Academy's oversights, and there are many. Yeah, I agree. So before we get into the nominees and specifically the Best Picture nominees, I thought it'd be good to kind of zoom out a bit and take an overview of the Academy Awards as they stand in the year 2023. Because I think it's fair to say that the last eight years or so have been some of the most tumultuous and transformative in the entire history of the Academy. If we think back even to 2015, we see the emergence of Oscar So White. Me Too in 2017 also emerged. And both of these kind of movements changed how we talk about films. They really kind of made race and gender an essential part of how films are discussed, uh, both in the legacy media and on social media. And it's also worth noting, too, that in the wake of these movements, and even before these movements came to light, the Oscars, uh, the Academy, was going about kind of diversifying and expanding its membership. And if we look at the numbers, I think in 2010, it was around 6,000 people in the 90s and, and 2000s and into the early 2010s. The membership was capped at around 6,000 people. It's now grown to over 9,000. So it has expanded a lot. It's also greatly diversified. And they actually had diversity goals they wanted to meet in 2020, which they did. And this has kind of really shifted the voting composition of the Academy and really kind of has changed which sort of films are nominated and which sort of films win. It's also become much more internationalized. And this is something that hasn't really been discussed as much as it should be, I think, because it is very important. It's one reason, for example, why Parasite did so well at the 2020 Oscars. Mm -hmm. And I was reading an interesting interview on Vox with the uh, statistician Walt Hickley, who kind of was making the point that this internationalization, this globalization, may reflect kind of a soft power ambition on the part of the academy to globalize the institution so that it can maintain its legitimacy as other international markets challenge Hollywood's uh, hegemony over Mm -hmm. the kind of awards industry, the movie awards industry. And looking ahead to next year, the Academy has also announced plans to add diversity requirements for films to be eligible to be nominated for Best Picture. So that's going to be a big part of the conversation for next year. But just kind of looking back at some of these trends, these movements, these changes, do you think the Academy's response to these kind of demands for change were were good ones? For my part, I think it is good to, in one sense, to add diversity. I think diversity is good in filmmaking. I'm concerned a bit that it's 
that it is more like you say a, a, a soft power issue that seems a bit corporate uh, you know in terms of the fear being that things are going to become kind of too vast and spread out I think we see some of this in the in the nominations that there are for best picture right now now we've got 10 nominations right so it's already quite yeah. a quite a huge field and it's trying to encompass a lot of different areas when really to me the academy awards are very much still a hollywood power self-congratulatory thing i was really interested in in the research you were doing there that it expanded from six thousand to nine thousand over the course of 10 years i think do you know if that yes. expansion has been international or has it been more based on demographics within the United States? It's been mostly international. The Academy, I, I believe, noted that and almost kind of bragged uh, about the fact that I think one year the expansion, it was 45 or 49 percent international. Mm. And as a result, this has kind of taken away relative voting power from certain departments, for example, mm. like writing, sound, acting. These branches of the academy now have less power as other branches have kind of gained in power. Uh, I believe short films, visual effects. Uh, there's something called voters at large, I think, mm. which includes a, a kind of uh, various, various kind of departments within filmmaking and and even things like agents and stuff like that. But a lot of these departments have been internationalized. And this is a relatively under-discussed kind of mm -hmm. aspect of, of how the Oscars have developed. Because a lot of times their diversification efforts are kind of discussed more in terms of like, you know, more Asian American actors, uh, mm -hmm. more African American actors being added or, or, you know, cast and crew and stuff like that, rather than, you know, a lot of these uh, diversity requirements being met by adding more international members. Okay. So what do you see as the shifts that are going on here? Well, I agree with you that it's, it's taking kind of a corporate turn. I mean, I, I believe it's a complex issue. Uh, I agree that more diversity is good, but the kind of diversity that we're talking about is, is I think also limited, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, economics is not really a part of this discussion, mm. which is kind of insane if you think about how much money drives Hollywood. Money is, is not really part of the conversation that you know, people from everything from like people from poor economic backgrounds who have less access to funding are not part of this conversation in terms of making the Oscars, I guess, more accessible in some ways or more open. Uh, and the a lot of the structures, the power structures that remain from before in terms of, you know, the outside influence that studios have in terms of influencing who gets nominated or even just the rules that are kind of set up to make it almost impossible for people who don't have major studio support and funded behind them to be nominated or recognized. All of these power structures have remained intact while at the same time, you know, the Oscars have opened up in terms of, you know, mostly racial and gender categories. So I think there's a lot left to be desired in terms of, you know, the Oscars truly diversifying mm -hmm. uh, and including things like economics. But also, I think a lot of the discussion over films uh, has has really been driven by social media. I mean, it, it's I, I don't think you can overstate how important it is that the two movements that really altered the Oscars and led to a lot of social pressure for the Oscars to change, both came from social media, right? Mm -hmm. The hashtag yes. Me Too, hashtag Oscars So White. Mm -hmm. And this ties into something that I actually talked about on a previous episode that I, I did, Mike and I did, with a guest, uh, John W. Gunnison. We did a two-part series called The End of the Movies. Mm -hmm. And we looked at a, an op-ed by an opinion writer named Ross Douthat at the New York Times, who basically made the point that social media has d displaced cinema as the main popular art form in America. And if that is the case, 
and you know we get into a lot of details about why we kind of agree with that point then i don't think it can simply be said that social media was the vessel for these kind of demands for the oscars to change and be more representative and more diverse but rather i think the power of these movements signaled the power of the medium itself and kind of the dominant values of social media over the medium of cinema it's it's I think the case that cinema itself as a medium is being displaced. And whatever you may think about the impact of social media and, you know, it's it's kind of dominant values. I think there's no doubt if you look at the, you know, some of the nominees this year, uh, and especially if you look at the, the discussions around film, that, you know, the, the dominant values of social media have displaced what we might call cinematic values. Things like, and I'm talking about social media now, identity, talking about, you know, psychology and character in terms of trauma, things like meme ability, fandoms, and particularly toxic fandoms. These are really driving a lot of the film discourse. And even I think it has impacted how films are being made today. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of wrap up that point, I mean, some people might be wondering, all right, what do you mean by cinematic values? You know, what do you mean by cinema? And I, I will simply defer to uh, a little known director named Marty Scorsese on this, who mm. wrote this famous op-ed for the New York Times when he was kind of criticizing Marvel movies. And he made the case that like cinema and cinematic values are things like, quote, aesthetic, emotional, and spiritual revelation complex mm -hmm. characters, confronting the unexpected on screen, an element of risk. These are all things that he mentions are, to him, cinema and cinematic values. And I think it would be hard to argue that these values are in the process of being displaced by kind of the sort of values we see on social media. And, and we may be witnessing kind of a, a, a shift in the, you know, the medium itself when social media kind of comes to dominate cinema as the main popular art form but i've kind of laid out a lot of stuff here so i'm just kind of wondering what what you think of all that no that's good i think that's a good way of, of framing where we're at right now i don't know that i'm on board for the diagnosis that social media is replacing cinema i think that the two can stand alone except that of course as you say they are I don't want to say infecting each other, but they are influencing each other. <laughs> but I also think that these things kind of happen in waves and cycles and trends. To me, I think there's always going to be a hunger for the, you know, a shared space of storytelling. You know, I'm thinking of Walter Murch talking about how cinema is dreamlike. And when you go into the theater, everybody's sharing the same dream experience. And and I do think that that's an element that people really, you know, feel strongly. So I think cinema will transform, but I also think that we're going to have, it's going to take some time to see what is, what are trends and what kind of forms that cinema will, will take. You know, of course it has a long history of surviving, you know, with the threats of TV and the threats of the internet. And we're just going right. to have to see what happens there. But I think it's helpful to to make a distinction of i think two things at work and one is the way we discuss films as a means of discussing changes in cultural norms and advancements and equality and important social issues and then the second thing is the way these changes have become integrated into film narratives so I think that they're mm. different processes. So the former, I would say, is the realm of media and criticism, which, you know, is something I think there's a lot of people studying critical theory, cultural theory, film theory. I think this is a very popular thing in, in master's programs and even undergraduate programs. And I think that people go out and they graduate from school and they, you know, graduate from college and they get jobs producing content. There's so much content now and it generates income for these different publications in terms of advertising and clicks and things like that and and that to me ties in with the social media element because the social media feeds off of that right but then the, the second thing is film development which which generates its income at least ideally from its product and you know this was 
something that happened with the distinction of cinema and TV, you know, before the internet came along, you know, that TV was a medium of advertising and with content and film was a, a medium of content with an element of advertising, you know, but now mm -hmm. these things have kind of gotten blended together. But I do think that films, movies still do stand on their own, but that both create their own sets of problems. And one of the things that I'm really concerned about is how things are, how, how the narratives of film are changing. Mm. So there's, there's kind of two sets of concerns and, and film criticism is so massive right now. Media criticism, I guess I would agree in the sense that media criticism feels even more popular than what it criticizes. Um, so that would be kind of a, a you know, a way of framing uh, and perhaps another way of what's going on here. Yeah. And to your point about cinema kind of continuing to exist independently of social media, I think you're definitely right. My concern is that on the one hand, a lot of the films that we would talk about as being exemplary films in terms of cinema really haven't done very well commercially. I mean, in mm -hmm. fact, they've done very poorly. You can look this at Tar, true. you can look at yeah. the Fablemans, you can look mm -hmm. at Babylon even, something that you would expect would have more popular appeal. Uh, the Northman did uh, pretty okay, I think, at the box office, but even that was a, considered kind of a disappointment and, and almost a bomb. And mm -hmm. if you look at the performance of these films, it does kind of, it's cause for concern, I think, in terms of the commercial viability of cinema. And I think if you look at the success of, you know, the continuing success of Marvel movies, but also movies like Top Gun, Everything Everywhere mm -hmm. All at Once, movies that are more spectacle driven. And in the case of Everything Everywhere All at Once, and I think you could say a lot of Marvel movies, much more designed for kind of a social media obsessed audience. Mm -hmm. that that is worrying. I mean, one part of this conversation that makes this whole thing kind of hard to talk about with any degree of certainty is streaming mm -hmm. because it's a very opaque industry. We don't have a lot of access to numbers. Uh, a lot of these streaming companies kind of keep their numbers secret and we don't really know True. how much money is made, how these movies perform. So it may be the case that in the future going forward, movies like Tar will, or The Fablemans will do kind of poorly in theaters mm -hmm. and then make their budget back and more on streaming platforms and, and may somehow find a, a second life there. But again, without seeing numbers, we don't really know. We can't really mm -hmm. say that with any degree of certainty. I think to your second point about how social media, or rather how film criticism has, has expanded and become this thing that's, that's almost bigger than the films themselves. I think that only speaks to, again, the impact of social media and just the fact that there is this kind of symbiotic relationship and that I think social media perhaps found a much better bedfellow in, in film criticism and that in turn had kind of downstream effects on what films were funded, what films became popular. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, you know, if you look at everything everywhere all at once, that, that's just dominated social media. Mm -hmm. And I'll just finish off with this, you know, kind of a slight tangent, but I think it's very much related. Something I'd like to look more into, which is how if you look at A24, for example, as this kind of like very hot production company, Mm -hmm. and studio one of the keys to their success i think is how they've mastered social media mm -hmm. and in a way that every other studio i think is very envious of uh, they are very successful at kind of using social media and perhaps choosing the sorts of films that are you know that play well on social media that they've been able to really attract audiences to their film I don't necessarily think this is a good thing going forward, but it is to their credit. They've they found an audience for everything everywhere all at once where like, for example, uh, was Fox Searchlight couldn't do the same for Babylon or something mm -hmm. like that. So it's that's another part of the conversation, I think. Yeah. So I don't think we're in, in disagreement. So what you were 
what you were critiquing is my was my second point was that I do think that social media is, you know, having an effect on the narratives and having the, an effect on the way that cinema is being done. So I agree with you there. You know, so so my first point was basically kind of how social media is affecting culture at large. My second point was, yeah, about how it's affecting films. And obviously there's positive things going on and there's there's some not so positive things going on. Right. But we, you know, we see this playing out in in terms of the narratives in some of these films that we that we have in this group of of nominees. We see Me Too and feminism grappling with these tensions. 